the Brink by the Reverend Leslie Takahashi. All that we have ever loved and all that we have ever been stands with us on the brink. Brink of all that we aspire to create. A deeper peace, a larger love, a more embracing hope, a deeper joy in this life we share. Good morning. I'm Karen Mazzotta. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Huntington's virtual Sunday service. It's great to be together. We're streaming live from multiple locations, so please be patient for any technical mishaps you might see or hear. We're using Zoom's meeting format so we can all see each other. We're also streaming live on Facebook. A big hello to everyone who is joining us there today. We'd like to extend a special welcome to visitors who may be joining our virtual service for the first time, as well as any newcomers who are returning. If you're new to our congregation and want to speak with someone to learn more about us, please contact us by email at office at uufh.org. We'll put this information in the chat during the service as well. Know that whoever you are and whomever you love and wherever you are in your life's journey, you are welcome here. Our guest speaker today is the wonderful Dr. Janice Marie Johnson, co-director of ministries and faith development at the Unitarian Universalist Association. We're grateful to have her here today. She supports, sustains, and advances multicultural, anti-oppressive, justice-centered, and innovative Unitarian Universalist lay and professional leadership and ministry for all ages. In addition, she is co-founder of the Living Legacy Project, whose mission is to experientially share the civil rights movement narrative from capturing the stories to understanding what they teach us about the ongoing work that still needs to be done for racial equity. We have a few brief announcements. This year's Strengthen Our UU Lives pledge drive is off to a great start. We have much to look forward to during this time of change and exciting new contract minister, the Reverend Dr. Deborah Hafner, improvements to the safety and structure of our building and revisioning our programs to respond to the needs and circumstances of our members and our community. Our members and friends continue to be the soul of our congregation and our pledges continue to be the largest source of financial support for the fellowship. They provide, along with other sources of income, the foundation for our congregational budget. Please show your support and your commitment by making your pledge by the deadline of February 15th. The board uses our pledges to create and propose the annual budget for the upcoming year. So it's very important. If you pledged before, you should have received a pledge from, from the fellowship via email. Pledge forms are also available online on the uufh.org website. You click on the blue pledge button, it says 20, 22, 23, or the brown donations and pledges tab at the top of the home page. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact Sue McGovern. Forms can be returned online to stewardship at uufh.org or be printed and mailed to the office at 109 Brown Road. Huntington 11743. And now I invite you to settle into your bodies and quiet your minds as we breathe deeply together and settle into our time of worship. Please join me in saying our mission statement. The words will be on the screen. In religious community, we nurture our individual spirits through caring for one another and helping to heal the world. Please join me in singing our affirmation, Common Ground.
Abundance by Dawn Shea Cooley. We light our chalice this morning, grateful for the love that we experience in this beloved community. May the flame light the way for all who seek such abundance. Now I'd like to introduce Carolyn DeRazio, who will be explaining our February RE project, The Gratitude Jar. Carolyn? Good morning. Our RE committee is uh, leading our RE families with a Gratitude February Jar project, and we'd like to welcome the entire fellowship. We'd like to welcome the whole uh, fellowship to join in with us. Each of the RE families has received a jar, some paper scraps, some fun pens, and some gratitude prompts. Danielle did send an email this morning to the whole fellowship explaining the project as well as including the, the daily prompts if you'd like to join us. And we're asking that all the families sit down together at some point during the day, whether it's at the breakfast table, the dinner table, and share their gratitude each day for the month of February and fill our jars. And we're asking that people take photos as they do the project and email them to Danielle. And we're going to put together a fellowship uh, collage of all the completed gratitude jars. My Gratitude Jar, written and illustrated by me. Kristen Weens. My teacher, Miss Lane, is always trying to make the world a better place. In the fall, our class visited a home for old people and read them our poems. In the spring, we planted flowers at the park near our school. And once a week, we go on litter patrol. Yuck! Miss Lane says it's important for everyone to do their part. One day at school, Miss Lane gave everyone a jar. This is your gratitude jar, she said. Gratitude means being thankful. It's a good idea to take time every day to remember to be grateful. You can be grateful for big things, like when you make a new friend. You can be grateful for little things, like when someone smiles at you. There is no right or wrong way to be grateful. Every day, we will take a few minutes to stop and pay attention to what we are grateful for at that moment. We will write it down and put it into our gratitude jar. Why are we making gratitude jars, I asked. Miss Lane said, there are two reasons. One reason is that when we take time to be grateful, we feel happier. What is the other reason, I asked. You will have to wait and see, she said. We spent the afternoon decorating our jars. I put blue polka dots all over mine. The next day, we all wrote down something we were grateful for. I asked Miss Lane again, what is the other reason for our gratitude jars? She said, wait and see. In a few weeks, our gratitude jars were full of things we were thankful for. Most days, I wrote down one thing. Some days, I wrote down two. One day, I wrote down three things I was grateful for. It was a very good day. I asked Miss Lane again, what is the second reason for our gratitude jars? She said, wait and see. I am grateful I found a quarter on the ground. I am grateful I got an invitation to Benjamin's birthday party. I am grateful we can play soccer outside at lunch. A few days later, I had a very bad day. When I got out of bed, I stepped right on top of the castle that I had built the night before. 
It hurt a lot and wrecked the castle. I spilled my oatmeal all over the kitchen floor. I had to clean it up all by myself. We were out of my favorite bubblegum flavored toothpaste. I had to use the mint kind. The mint kind hurts my mouth. Then my brother called me shrimp. I hate it when he calls me shrimp. When I got to school, I was grumpy. When I got my gratitude jar, I had nothing to write. Now Miss Lane would be mad. Now my day would get worse. I needed a complaint jar, not a gratitude jar. There is nothing to be thankful for today, I told Miss Lane. I am not grateful for this morning. I am not grateful for school. And I am certainly not grateful for my brother. It sounds like you had a rough start to your day, said Miss Lane. Some days are like that. So today is the day you get to learn the second reason for your gratitude jar. Even though I was grumpy, I still wanted to know the second reason. Miss Lane said, Today, instead of writing a new gratitude, you get to open your jar and read all of the gratitudes you have already written. That's it? That's the other reason? That doesn't seem very important. Try it and see. Before you open your jar, you might want to take a few deep breaths. When I have a bad day, taking a few deep breaths always helps. It makes me feel a bit calmer. See if it helps you too. I took a big breath in and slowly blew it out. I took a big breath in and slowly blew it out. I took a big breath in and slowly blew it out. I think it did help. I felt a little calmer. I opened my jar and took out the gratitudes one by one. I read them all. Then I started to understand the second reason. I felt less grumpy. I remembered that not all days were bad days. Lots of days were good days. The last note in the gratitude jar was not one that I had written. It was from Miss Lane. I am thankful for Jacob. He helps make the classroom a happier place. That made me smile. I picked up my pencil and began to write. I am grateful for my gratitude jar and Miss Lane. The end. I invite us all to sing Spirit of Life. Following the song, we'll enter into a time of silence and then prayer. As you participate at home, remember that it's not about the perfection of silence, but the intention. Join with me in singing now.
Prayer for Rising to the Occasion by Laura Horton Ludwig. May this time of quiet be an opportunity to touch peace within ourselves, to tap new springs of courage, resolve, and hope. We know that none of us alone can hold all that must be held or do all that must be done, but each of us be led toward that work which is ours to do. And as a community, may we feel our strength together and use it for good as best we can. In this spirit, we name our concern for this land and for its people and for the people of the world. For refugees, we pray for safe harbor. We pray for all immigrants who fear for their safety and the safety of their families and loved ones. May they be well and safe. May all who move to action in these times be clear and strong and compassionate in our response. For those worried about how they will pay for the cost of medical care, for those worried about access to medical care, including women around the world, for our planet and the ongoing climate crisis, we pray for effective and creative action. May all who are moved to action in these times be clear and strong and compassionate in our response. We also hold all those tender personal concerns which are close to our hearts this day. I invite you now to share the names of any whom you like to lift up into the care of this community or simply hold them in your heart in silence. Please write their names in the chat box so that we may read them aloud. Janice, Doris, Mary Manier, Martha, Dottie and Mark, Reggie, Anne Hanley, Beth, Tom, Grandma Lucy, Ruth Ann, Christine, Darren, Grandpa Jeff and Jessica, Becky, Genevieve, Deb, Lorraine and Marge, Roz, Elliot, Michael. May they be well, Evelina. May they feel the love that surrounds them. Let us take a moment to give thanks for the blessings emerging even now for women and girls who are leading us forward and showing us what peaceful empowerment looks like, we give thanks. For journalists and scientists, attorneys and public servants, and so many others who are offering truth and wisdom in a time of need, we give thanks. For ordinary people, including you and me, who are rising to the occasion and bringing the best that is in us, as best we can, we give thanks. We close with a few more breaths in silence. May it be so, amen. Our split plate for the month of February is the Huntington branch of the NAACP. The vision of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People is to ensure a society in which all individuals have equal rights without discrimination based on race. Founded in 1909, the NAACP is the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization. From the ballot box to the classroom, the thousands of dedicated workers, organizers, leaders, and members who make up the NAACP continue to fight for social justice for all Americans. The Huntington branch works with the state and national offices to strengthen our commitment to supporting equality and justice in the Huntington community. You can send a check to the office or donate through the website as seen on the screen. You can also donate through the Vanco mobile app, which, you can, which can be found on the app store or Google Play. We hope that you'll give generously. Thank you.
Community Means Strength by Starhawk. We are all longing to go home to some place we have never been, a place half remembered and half envisioned. We can only catch glimpses of from time to time. Community, somewhere there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. Somewhere a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up when we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means strength that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter, a circle of healing, a circle of friends, some place where we can be free. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Don't you know that? This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, I said the world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. Oh, this strength that I have, this strength that I have. This Resistance Revival Chorus believes in the words written by the poet Toy Derricotte when she wrote, joy is an act of resistance. 
We believe in the words of Mr. Harry Belafonte, who said, when the movement is strong, the music is strong. We sing to revive the hearts of those who fight for social justice. And we sing together for freedom. Good morning. I'm delighted to be back worshiping with you again. My thanks to Jim, Karen, and to all who conspired to create today's worship service. Deep, deep gratitude. Well, this joy, what a song that so resonates. It restores my faith when I falter from the vicissitudes of daily life. It reminds me that we are, in Takahashi's words, on the brink of realizing a deeper peace, a larger love, a more embracing hope, a deeper joy in this life we share. And oh my, we each need a gratitude jar for the journey. We do. For me to best understand joy, grace, and gratitude, I look to the South African concept of Ubuntu that recognizes the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Ubuntu, Ubuntu supposes that if we are able to see ourselves in other people, our life experience will inevitably be a richer, kinder, and more connected one. Friends, it is so challenging to navigate this season of pandemic writ large. So much is at stake along all manner of lines on the landscape of politics, health, economics, and so much more. And without question, our Unitarian Universe's principles do not allow us to ignore the disparate impact of the COVID-19 virus, plus racism, plus racial violence that continues to especially batter Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. And regarding the COVID climate in which I live, on a personal level, I wrestle with questions such as, shall I travel across the continent to gather with my beloved colleagues at a retreat? Shall I meet a dear friend and dine indoors in a restaurant because it's too cold outside? Shall I buy another stash of N95 masks? Wonder how much more can we take as COVID drags on. I do wonder how much more of this can I take? These kinds of questions are dragging me down. And yet I know that I am ever the optimist who can imagine the light at the end of a tunnel, even if I have to drill the hole myself. I will find that light guiding me to a holy place. Because for me, holiness takes many forms. Nature at her best, hands held in solidarity, soul searching, soul stirring, soul enlivening music like we just heard. When I falter, I rely on grace and gratitude to help me out and to help me through. Psychologist Kathy Lightheart defines grace as the experience of awe, gratitude, and unconditional love when you are in harmony with yourself, with others, and with the creative power that creates the cosmos. I appreciate her definition. And I would add that for me, grace also has much to do with God's grace. 
it is for me that original blessing of being alive. For many years, my neighbor and elderly woman, Ms. Rose, would greet me each morning with a chirpy, good morning. I'm vertical. I'd greet her warmly and honor her presence, knowing that being vertical meant that grace had been hers, being alive for the gift of yet another morning. Grace is community, courage, and connection. It is gratitude for our blessings, despite the less than favorable circumstances. It is the joy, the good times, the laughter, even if these days mostly over Zoom. It is about people who come into our lives with an abundance of goodness and generosity. When I think of special people in my life, the person who embodied and effused grace was Helene Lightborn. She was a retired Bellevue rehabilitation nurse from Bermuda. She filled her days with caring and service, her joyful humanity inspiring everyone she met. I, like many, refer to her as a living angel. She always reminded me of the power of grace to awaken life, to spark joy, and to welcome gratitude. And I believe that grace is available to everyone. It allows us to have those often unexpected moments that sweeten our lives. It is a smile that you least expect from a stranger. It is a rainbow that we see after a storm. It is the look of love shared. It's also the gift for me, at least, of hassle-free travel. And I believe that grace honors freedom. Really, one of my favorite children's books is Amazing Grace by Mary Huffman. The character Grace is a black child who loves stories and with a boundless imagination, she acts all of them out. On one occasion, she wanted to play the lead role of Peter Pan for her school pageant. Well, a classmate told her that she couldn't take that role. Why not? Because she was a girl, because Peter Pan was a boy, because she was black, because Peter Pan was white. And Grace believed her classmate. Thankfully, with loving support from her mother and grandmother, who reminded her that she could be anything she wanted to be. Grace auditioned for the role and got it hands down. For me, that speaks to pressing on and succeeding regardless of race, gender, culture, and so forth. I have to note that when I was growing up, there were no books celebrating me. Amazing Grace was written over 30 years ago. The author, a white woman, decided to name the character Grace and riffed on the hymn, deciding that her Grace had to prove that she was amazing. And despite the flack, much flack, that Hoffman received for daring to write a book featuring a black child in that favorable light, Amazing Grace became a classic and it paved the way for many other books featuring, finally featuring children of color. I owe a debt of gratitude to Mary Hoffman. Grace is so big, gratitude is so profound and so multifaceted, encouraging us to lead, 
I'm thinking of the grace of Grace Lee Boggs, that beloved activist who chose to defy wrongs in her world. She was an author, social activist, philosopher, and feminist. She was Chinese American. Her mother's family came from very humble beginnings in Toishan, China. They were poor, so poor that Grace's mother, Yin Lan, was sold into slavery. Luckily, she escaped, and Yin Lan was an early role model for her organizer and activist daughter, Grace. In announcing her death in 2015 at 100 years of age, the New York Times noted that Grace Lee Boggs was one of the nation's oldest human rights activists who waged a war of inspiration for civil rights, labor, feminism, the environment, and other causes for seven decades with an unflagging faith that revolutionary justice is just around the corner. I'm not surprised that she was auntie and mentor to Adrian Marie Brown, that brilliant force of nature who is teaching us about emergent strategies for holistic living. Yeah, grace and gratitude have the power to teach. Let me share a wonderful five part invocation with you. It was written by my colleague, the Reverend Ted Gallardo, President and Executive Minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Philippines. Part one Ultimate grace, the heart of every matter in every perfection and imperfection in all senses and tenses in moments of every right and wrong, presenting choices to inquiring hearts. You are the purpose and the journey of mishaps. You are in moments of understanding and misunderstanding. We have but to seek and invoke you and enable the work of your spirit. As prayer is but an articulated common dream, we invoke our ultimate concern for the work of faith. We long to be hand in hand, creating a world where everyone belongs. Grace and gratitude are reflected in others. And Ted reminds us that they might just be the great spirit. Part two, free us from our hindrances, make invisible things visible, the voiceless heard, lay what is hidden before us, make the chain unbound, the, the doubting believe. What is confusing, let clarify as hardened hearts grow soft to the touch. May we come in fullness with gratefulness, in faithfulness to one another. May we speak in kind conversing, disclosing our truths with care, expressing our practical wisdom to learn. For the world was not meant to be possessed by a higher truth, but to be built together upon revelations. So Ted reminds us that grace and gratitude respect many truths. Part three, oh universe with stars in your hair, you have shown that great things emerge from humble beginnings, no matter how flawed and lacking. That one story in a stable, in prison, in the cave, 
in destitution, in abject poverty, if lived in all sincerity, can liberate from darkness, pain, and unfathomable circumstance. Ted reminds us that grace and gratitude recognize a divine spark in each of us. Part four, may our eyes seek to appreciate our breaths to dedicate power, our hands to warm each other. When loving fearlessly, we are invincible. When free will is deliberate, we are pivotal. When dreaming together, we are infinite. It is Ted who reminds us that grace and gratitude embrace wholeness. And finally, part five, remind us of the very questions that we have turned away from, that we thought could not be answered or are impossible to realize. Dear universal intelligence, your embrace contains everything, confines nothing in the ever insistence of existence, may this one moment count. Ted certainly reminds us that to question is to answer and at its best to answer is to question. Yes, we are living in tough times still in the midst of the season of pandemic of all sorts. What do we do about this? What is our collective responsibility? Might we boldly embrace this moment that can with faith and tenacity lead us to a measure of freedom? It's a lot. But we must simultaneously demand justice in ways large and small. And as well as answer urgent calls for justice. And justice is not without joyful interplay. As we heard right after the song, it is Toy Derricotte, the Black feminist poet, who reminds us that joy is an act of resistance. In closing, let's reflect on the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, who encourages us to cultivate the habit of being grateful for every good thing that comes to you and to give thanks continuously. And because all things have contributed to your advancement, you should include all things in your gratitude. May Tet's invocation offer sustenance so that our gratitude jars may be filled so that we may lead, love, and live with gratitude and with grace. Ashe, Amen, and Masakan. Thank you. Move Through the World in Love by Maggie Lovins. We extinguish this flame, but not its meaning and mission in our hearts. Our time together has come to an end. Go in peace, be of service to one another, 
And may you move through the world in love for all of your days. Be true, be well, be loving by the Reverend Cynthia Landrum. We lead this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection, our concerns, our care for each other, our service to each other, to the world and to our faith continues until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be true, be loving. Mm -hmm.